So our digital world imposes demands on us that are very different from the kind of context in which our brain evolved. And this difference has serious implications for how effectively and efficiently we're able to perform tasks in the real world. So let's make this idea concrete by exploring an example of how our world has changed and the effect it has on us. We look at the evolution of the road trip. So for um, many, many thousands of years, we traveled relatively slowly. We either walked to places or we rode in semi-autonomous vehicles like this horse-drawn carriage. And the task of getting this carriage from one place to another was fairly straightforward. You kept the horse pointing in the right direction, looked out for robbers, made sure you didn't run into obstacles. There were very few intense processing requirements that the vehicle would demand of the, of the driver. You caught up with news when you got to your destination, and the only communication you engaged in was with people in your immediate proximity. So fast forward to the 1960s, and um, you see the automobile firmly entrenched in our lives and in our culture. Um, but we get to places faster, but our roles as a driver has changed. You now control a high-velocity projectile, and often you're driving in a projectile stream. So the consequences in this context of a moment of inattention or distraction are severe. But in many ways, if you can just focus on the task of driving, the vehicle imposes very few additional demands on you. You have a passive AM radio that will break the monotony of your drive, and communications occur when you pull into town, and that's where you catch up with your news. It's just you and the road. <clears throat> Fast forward to today, and you're driving a vehicle with an active collision avoidance system, lasers in the front and on the side, an engine monitoring system, you've got satellite navigation, onboard entertainment, multi-channel communications. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking I was describing the systems on a Boeing 787 or Airbus 350 that are operated by a crew of two that are highly trained. But I'm talking about mom and dad operating the family car. And as if this wasn't demanding enough, we have these auxiliary devices that we bring into the vehicle that are completely unconstrained and introduced a thousand distractions. And if you let yourself do it, you can take every single available cognitive cycle and apply it to this task. Now, the problem is we really can't get away from the effects of this technology, <laughs> no matter what we try to do, as this hapless man is trying. So the problem is research has shown that even the mere awareness of a text notification can have a serious impact on your task performance, even on simple laboratory tasks. So why is all this an issue? I mean, the, the reason this is a problem is that the, the environment around us is imposing demands that are really reaching the limits of our cognitive capabilities. So if you consider our working memory system, for instance, we can handle about seven plus or minus two units of information. Our attentional systems, which are necessary for taking our cognitive system and applying it focused on particular aspects of the task environment, are now splitting attention by so many different concurrent demands. So the question for all of us is, how do we keep up? And this is where our research at Honeywell comes in. We've tried to address this issue uh, with three broad thrusts of research. The first is creating systems that are sensitive to cognitive state. So these are systems that, like a polite office coworker who first checks to see whether you're on the phone and you aren't engaged in a busy task before engaging in a conversation, is able to modulate its interaction with you depending on what's going on in your head. The second thrust of research is to come up with novel ways of interacting with computer systems. And the idea here is to come up with ways of interaction that are more natural, perhaps less effortful, so that you can then apply those cognitive cycles to other tasks or to handle more. And the third thrust of research is enhancing cognitive capacity so that we're able to take on much, much more. So let's tackle the first thrust here of creating systems that are sensitive to cognitive state. Now, in the example that I described a moment ago of um, somebody coming into your office and being able to peer over your shoulder and figure out what's going on, that was enabled by an inference that uh, a person could make. Now, what we're trying to do is to give a computer the capability of making just such an inference. 
And one way of doing it is to look at neural activity, which can provide us with a lot of insight into how hard the brain is working. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Here you have two images of a brain performing an easy task on the left and a harder version of the task on the right, same task. And what's happening here on the, with the image on the right is that you see much broader cortical recruitment and higher amplitude of activity. You can see similar effects when you're looking at evolving expertise. So with the image on the bottom, if you go left to right, you can see somebody learning a motor tracking task early on in the skill acquisition process where performance is effortful. You can see a lot more areas of the brain are lit up. So it's not just the regions that are essential for performing the task. You have a whole bunch of supporting functions that are concurrently active. But as the person gains proficiency and the task is almost automatic and effortless, you just see the parts of the brain that are responsible for the automatic execution of the task. So brain activity and measurements of brain activity can tell us a lot about underlying cognitive effort. But unfortunately, these images were gathered using devices like this, um, a magnetic resonance imaging tool, which is excellent for laboratory research, but impractical for use in the kind of context that we've been talking about which is why our efforts have focused on EEG. So here's how EEG systems work. When we're performing tasks, our brain engages billions of neurons. And as these neurons fire in a synchronous way, they generate electric fields. And you can sense these electric fields on the surface of the head as small voltage fluctuations. And you can read these voltage fluctuations and make inferences about all kinds of pro cognitive processes that are happening in the brain. Uh, reasoning processes, motor processes, attention, etc., just to name a few. Now, the practicality of the sensors used to make these kind of inferences are changing all the time. They're coming down in cost, becoming much more practical. And this is a commercially available headset pictured in this image here. In the near future, they'll be in your headphones, they'll be in your eyewear, uh, in caps, helmets, etc. So our focus has not been on hardware. It's been on developing software components that work on the data coming out of uh, these hardware systems. Our focus is on building software that can reliably work with the data coming in to make inferences about cognitive state. And so we clean up the signals as they come from, the source, uh, from these um, hardware sources using uh, digital signal processing techniques. We then implement dimensionality reduction techniques that identify features of the data that are most informative with respect to the estimation that you're trying to make. And finally, we use machine learning models that are individualized to be able to look at your brain and identify the features that allow us to estimate whether you're in a high cognitive load situation or low cognitive load situation, high attention, low attention, etc. Now, we've validated this kind of an approach in a variety of different contexts. Our efforts began with the DARPA-funded Augmented Cognition Program, where we worked with a group of industry and academic researchers to address this problem that the government was facing, the, the military, of being able to tell when soldiers whose job is supported by all kinds of electronic communication devices were interruptible. So not only were we able to demonstrate this at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in a high-fidelity training exercise, we were also able to show that cognitive state estimation in real-world context outside the laboratory was feasible. But one of the things about this environment is that the extremes of workload that you experience in the battlefield aren't representative of the kind of variation you might have in everyday context. And so since this effort, we've looked at trying to classify or estimate uh, variations in cognitive load that are less pronounced, like corporate pilots being able to uh, control an aircraft in cruise versus an approach to landing, or helicopter pilots trying to land a helicopter under varying conditions of difficulty. Even the difference between someone reading a difficult piece of text versus an easy piece of text. And so what this research, along with research to be able to estimate people's attention, allows us to do is to create systems that are more sensitive to human cognitive states. So instead of a drill sergeant barking information and expecting the user to keep up, we are creating systems that are like a cooperative passenger who sees that you're engaged while you're passing a truck and suppresses conversation. And when you're beginning to fade on a long drive, they engage in lively conversation and more engaging music to keep your performance in a zone where you're able to perform effectively. 
So our second thrust of research that I'd like to discuss is to come up with novel means of human-computer interaction using the neurotechnology that are more natural and require less effort of the, of the user. And I'll present two examples. The first is of an image processing application, and the second is of um, a brain-computer interface that's used to control an airplane. So the first of these applications is addresses a problem that we all face when you try to look for a specific image in the collection of photos you have on your home computer. It's a difficult task. It's difficult, especially if you don't have a lot of time. And this is the kind of uh, problem that image ana analysts in a variety of domains, medical image analysts, geospatial image analysts, face all the time. Now the problem is that the tools these analysts use are designed for slow and deliberate processing. You bring up large images and search them systematically to find the tumor or some kind of a target that's out there. But what we're able to do every day, almost automatically, is to make robust split-second perceptual judgments around us, like the kind of processes that we invoke when you detect and return a tennis serve or hit, respond to a baseball pitch or take an evasive maneuver to avoid an absent-minded squirrel along your path. So all of these things happen automatically, and we're interested in being able to identify the neural signatures associated with these kinds of events. And one signature in particular is the event-related potential. It's the brain's aha signal. I've seen something of interest here, now do something about it. And so the way this works in an image uh, analysis application is we take large satellite images that are tens of thousands of pictures wide and tall and break them into chips that we present at high-speed rates, you know, bursts of imagery flowing past you. And as these images are being screened by the user, we look at neural activity that follows each image, just a split second of neural data to identify the event-related potential signal that I just described. Now, what you could do then is create a probability map of areas that grab the analyst's attention. And you can take the probability map, overlay it on the original image, and you get a bunch of hotspots where the target is most likely. So instead of slow, deliberate search of this image that would have taken tens of minutes, you're able to reduce it to a high-speed scan that just takes about a minute or two. So turning the human into this high-speed sensor and bypassing our slow and deliberate ways of interacting with these systems. Now another application that we've used with the event-related potential signal is to have um, explore its use as a potential way to interact with computer systems. So what you'll see in this video is a journalist from Wired, Jack Stewart, controlling a multi-engine corporate aircraft using the event-related potential. So in front of Jack is a display that has a variety of commands, and these commands are highlighted at random. And all he has to do to control it is to glance at a command of interest and make a mental note when it highlights. And that generates the event-related potential that we can detect infer intent, and then execute it. So let's watch Jack control the airplane using neural signals. All right, Jack, you're flying this thing. Oh, OK, no hands. Uh, where would you like me to point? How about a right turn? Right turn, OK. Right turn, green. Oh, and we are right. That is crazy. We spend the next 30 minutes going through some maneuvers until I'm completely convinced that the system worked. So you can learn more about this, this flight uh, by going to wire.com. It's on YouTube as well. Um, but Jack flies around Seattle using this brain-computer interface with minimal training. So we've looked at two avenues of uh, enhancing human performance and augmenting it in a way that people can keep up with all the demands that are being thrown at them. The, the last thrust of research I'd like to talk about is to enhance cognitive capacity. And so what we've been doing is to try to enhance people's reasoning and problem-solving skills, which is tied to a construct known as fluid intelligence, which you measure through IQ tests. And the way we've done it is to try to identify the cognitive processes associated with fluid intelligence. It's the brain's executive function system. And so we target the executive function system in two ways. One is to build a cognitive training paradigm in the form of a game that exercises the components of the executive function system. And what we do in the game is not only vary the complexity of the game, but also variety, which is crucial for the training to transfer to real world context. The other thing we do as a person is playing this game is to stimulate the cortical substrate that supports these kind of tasks using mild electrical stimulation. 
And we've then evaluated this combination in large-scale studies with collaborators at Harvard Medical School, Northeastern University, Oxford University, using a game that was built with our collaborators at SimCoach Games. And what we've shown in independent assessments administered by the US government is that three weeks of training 30 minutes with this game and the combination of electrical stimulation can produce statistically reliable improvements in IQ scores. So we have a large-scale validation underway now to try to replicate the results that we obtained with this study. So I've shown you a few different avenues that we're exploring in our lab to try to augment human performance to keep up with the demands that we're surrounded with. Now, each of these areas of research is at its infancy, but hopefully it provided you with a glimpse of what the future might be like to help us all scale up, to keep up with the increasing demands of the world. Thank you.